Well, good morning. I'm very pleased to open this first session of the second day of the conference. The session is entitled Inculcating Social Values. Day one was really spent to develop the big picture of social responsibilities of universities with a focus on community and civic engagement. Today, we'll talk about the practicalities. I'm Eric Mazur, I'm a professor of physics at Harvard University, and I'm very pleased to introduce this distinguished panel. You have the detailed bios in your booklets, but before we start, let me very briefly run through the four panelists. Going from your left to right, next to me is Sharif Ahabsa Shahabuddin, who is vice chancellor of the National University of Malaysia with a long and distinguished career in accreditation and quality control in Malaysia. To her right is Nieves Tapia, founder and director of the Latin American Center for Service Learning, which is based in Argentina and which coordinates activities for 80 organizations and academic institutions in Latin America, the US, and Spain. To her right is Martin Paul, who is president of Maastricht University in the Netherlands, who started his career in medicine and pharmacology in Germany, and more recently moved into academic management. And finally, to his right is Rajesh Standon, who is co-director of the UNESCO panel on community-based research and social responsibility in higher education, recognized for his pioneering work in the area of civic engagement, governance, and community-based research. So each panelist will give a 20-minute uh, presentation, and after that, we'll have time for discussion until lunch. So first up, let me invite uh, Sharif Ahabsa Shahabuddin to speak about inducing cultural change in academia through social changes. Please welcome me, help, uh, join me in welcoming her. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Dr. Khalid Al Ankari, Minister of Higher Education, for inviting me to this conference. The topic, social responsibilities of universities, is very close to my heart and is very much influenced by my strong association with civil society as president of the National Council of Women's Organizations of Malaysia. I'm very honored to be asked to share UKM, the National University, I refer to it as UKM, UKM's experiences in inculcating social values through the exercise of its social responsibilities. Social responsibility is an imperative for UKM. It's in its DNA as reflected in the vision and mission statement. Established on 18th May, 1970, UKM is a people's university. It was born out of the aspirations of the people and the Malay rulers to promote Malay or Bahasa Melayu as an academic language and the medium of instruction in the education system. And kebangsaan means national. As such, we have a moral obligation to produce, protect, and inculcate the idea of a national self-knowledge of our culture and values. A common national language is a unifying force for a nation that has embraced diversity in the composition of its people. In October 2006, UKM was designated a research-intensive university to produce the human resource as well as to generate new knowledge and innovation in support of the country's march to a fully developed nation by 2020. UKM embarked on a transformation program to raise its research, education, and service outputs. And societal engagement is a mission underpinned by sustainability principles. Just allow me to briefly introduce UKM to you. We are a comprehensive research university with programs on three campuses. On the main campus in Bangi, 
The, com the programs range from engineering and technology to the natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities, including Islamic studies. Medicine and health sciences are on two other campuses in Kuala Lumpur. In addition, UKM has six research stations dedicated to scientific and sociological research on the sustainability of different ecological systems. These are the Langkawi UNESCO Geopark Station, Fraser's Hill Mountain System, the Mersing Tropical Marine Station, the Chini Lake Freshwater System, and of course, 100 acres of permanent forest on our main campus, complete with the herbarium and fernarium. We have more than 2,000 academic staff with a breakdown in senior, middle level, and junior staff as shown on the slide. Stu stu student enrollment is more than 24,000, of which slightly less than half are postgraduate students. And of the postgraduates, 32% or 33% are enrolled at doctoral level. And international students form 22.5% of postgraduate students. And more than half of them are in doctoral programs. Undergraduate enrollment is at 12,000. 737. Only 3% are international students at undergraduate level because priority is given to local undergrads. Coming back to social responsibility, in UKM, societal engagement is not mere outreach, but a mindset, as I said, reflected in the vision and mission in which the university commits to steer its research, education, and service functions to meet the emerging needs of society and to share its expertise and resources for participatory, bottom-up, people-centered developments. And in so doing, the university is able to fulfill its role as an active agent and partner in social change. It will also be the critic and conscience of society through the exercise of academic freedom to think and give opinions on societal issues independently without fear or favor. And social engagement enables the university to inculcate ethics, values, and responsibility through real-world lessons from the community as the classroom. In this way, tangibles such as spirituality, beliefs, tradition, custom, culture, sense of right or wrong, good or evil, tolerance, mutual respect, and valuing of diversity happiness and sharing and caring and loving are not marginalized. Let me just give you a few examples. I'm doing injustice to my colleagues because there are so many examples, but I'll show you just a few. And how values are inculcated through societal engagements. The first is in the research area, transfer of knowledge from more than 20 years of research on the geolo geological, archeological, cultural biodiversity and ecological wonders of the 99 islands of Langkawi in the northern part of Malaysia. And through our collaboration with, you, with the Langkawi Development Authority, Langkawi was, was declared the first UNESCO global geopark in Southeast Asia, becoming the world's 52nd geopark. That's not the important part. The important part is with the geopark comes the onslaught of tourists and the students learn about the challenges of a community grappling with tourism as an economic issue and visitors as a cultural issue. So they learn how to transfer knowledge so that culture and traditions of the people are preserved. UKM has built a research station on Langkawi to continue to collaborate with the authority in providing training for sustainable ecotourism activities, including community awareness programs to make sure the Joe Park remains sustainable. Another lesson in social values come from the experiences of the Institute of Solar Energy, which installed solar technology for indigenous people in remote areas. The intention was to provide power for modern telecommunication as well as street lighting. But the students found out that what the community really needs was power to charge the batteries in their boats. 
Boats as a form of physical communication are a priority compared to telecommunication. Boats are needed for their daily livelihood. Thus, students learn that bottom-up development requires a people-centric approach with identification of their real concerns and needs. And this approach goes a long way in eradicating poverty, ill health, and so on among people who live at the margins of development. Another lesson is from Tasik Chini. Also, um, our research shows that after 15 years of research reveal that the lake is threatened by the surrounding development activities, declining water quality with sedimentation and so on. Successful advocacy has resulted in the government supporting conservation activities and the application of uh, measures through our research to help restore the water quality as well as bring back the plants, the fish and other aqu aquatic life forms. In the process, students learn about bioconservation and more importantly, they learn about the need to eradicate poverty and revive the culture of the indigenous people who are proud of their traditions and heritage. The Lake Chini Research Group has collaborated with UNESCO to help the indigenous people with entrepreneurial activities and earn a better income by improving the quality of their handicrafts uh, made from plants growing around the lake and to help them find markets. Currently, Lake Chini, through our efforts, is designated a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. In education, we believe that the community is the best classroom for reinforcing social responsibility and for inculcating values such as caring for the environment and for the people regardless of beliefs, ideology and ethnicity. At least eight credits are allocated in every program for volunteerism in projects such as disaster relief, community health camps, legal aid, greening initiatives and environmental preservation. UKM has also introduced the Homestay Intercultural Understanding Programs where students lead, student leaders live with foster parents of other ethnicity and beliefs. What, are, what have we put in place for societal engagement? It depends not so much on institutional outreach, but more on the mindset to ensure that the university can fulfill its social responsibilities. Four key elements include good governance, institutional strategies, policies, and processes that support and facilitate the strategic engagement with all stakeholders. Sustainable relationship built on trust, integrity, and sincerity, as well as being able to convince community partners of mutually beneficial collaboration. Knowledge exchange by identifying and converting knowledge not only from the university, but from the community into innovative ideas that excite both them and us, and demonstrating value, which is the impact of collaboration on both the university and the community. Yesterday, Rod has alluded to the governance in UKM. We have a Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Community and Industry Partnership, and also coordinators at the faculty level, and they are responsible for implementing and planning the strategic engagement, uh, community engagement strategies, including funding, capacity building, and recognition for outstanding contribution of individuals and organizations. Within UKM, she works closely with the other three deputy vice chancellors to promote volunteerism in community projects, learning in the community, and community-based research, as well as transfer of research findings into community outcomes. She also work, works with external stakeholders, as well as for-profit organizations and civil society locally and internationally to secure societal engagement across research, education, and service. Societal engagement is one of the key performance indicators of the university. We measure the percentage of staff and students involved in social societal engagement the number of community-engaged projects, grants and endowments, as well as employability. With regards to annual appraisal and criteria for promotion, up to 20% of the points are allocated for societal engagement. 
not as a separate track, but integrated with research, education and service. Of course, students can accumulate up to eight credits, as I told you. If you're interested, I can elaborate in the questions. And recognition is given through annual innovation awards for community partnerships involving knowledge or technology transfer. Capacity building is also another important area in uh, social participatory research uh, for accessing funding and also in measurements. We are now very active in looking at measure measuring social impact of societal engagement projects. Sharing of good practices in societal engagement is enhanced through international networks such as UNESCO, for example, the Global Network, the Talwar Network of Community Engaged Universities, UKM is on the steering committee, and of course, UKM also lead the regional network through Asia Engage, which comprises universities subscribing to the Talwa philosophy, as well as the ASEAN University Network for Corporate Social Responsibility and the ASEAN Youth Volunteer Program. To strengthen community engagement, UKM has focused its research in 11 multidisciplinary areas aimed at creating greater impact on issues of local, national, and international concerns. The examples I quoted came from the group in sustainable regional development and in renewable energy. What has been the impact of societal engagement? Generally, we know the impact is tremendous, although difficult to measure in quantitative terms. Knowledge becomes more meaningful as it gets in exchanged for mutual benefits. The quality and effectiveness of educational and research programs are enhanced through links to the real society or world and become more relevant for current and future needs. We have a chance to develop knowledge communities and strengthen the national innovation system. We become better at applying our inventions innovatively to solve problems such as poverty and ill health. And we have the opportunity to provide real life and holistic learning experience for developing leadership, organizational ability, team spirit, and responsibility, as well as inculcate inter-ethnic respect and valuing of cultural diversity among students and staff. Efforts are now directed at developing better ways of measuring our impact on communities. There can be economic indicators from opportunities such as ecotourism, social left. business, entrepreneurship, and other job-creating opportunities, as well as growth of manufacturing industries. Environmental sustainability is another set of indicators, including community activities to mitigate climate change, including on our campus. More Im most importantly is the value to the community in terms of social well-being. Societal engagement which promotes intercultural understanding contributes to national unity, the bedrock of development, peace and prosperity and a better quality of life. Community engagement also develops good neighbor relationship because many of our students live in the community. All in all, societal engagement not only inculcates social values, but bring a better quality of life to the community. I would like to end by saying that we now live in the competitive world of university rankings. But what universities and teachers do to inspire young minds to create and innovate, to speak freely, unfettered by fear or anxiety, to be imbued with a deep sense of volunteerism, social responsibility, and entrepreneurship are not translated into ranking indicators. Nevertheless, we must continue to pursue societal engagement undaunted by uh, ranking pressures. At the end of the day, it is not just academic excellence that a university is judged by. By what, but what matters most is the immeasurable moral standards and its contribution to the quality of life of the people. As Einstein said, not all that counts can be counted. I'd like to thank you, Shukran, Jazila, 
this is our green campus that I couldn't show earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arifa, for so clearly articulating the moral obligations of a university to meet the emerging needs of society and to be uh, an agent of social change. And what I found particularly impressive was how under visionary leadership it was possible to maintain these principles in the transition from a people's university to a research intensive university. Well done. Next up is uh, Nieves Tapia, who will speak to us about service learning. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tapia. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's, it's really a, an honor and a pleasure to be here. I, I would like to thank all of you, but especially Dr. Salim Malik, we, we have been really felt welcome in these days. Um, my first time in Arabia Saudi, so it's a pleasure to be here. So I have to speak about service learning, and uh, it's difficult to say in 20 minutes about uh, a century-old pedagogy, but I will try. Uh, I'm not coming from an, a university, but from a nonprofit uh, organization. We are uh, an academic and research center, and we also raise funding for uh, schools and universities all through Latin America to help them uh, develop service learning projects. So uh, I'm coming from the, the end of the world, but I've discovered in these days that we, our countries share a common passion for football call in some places soccer, but we know that it's football. <laughs> so you probably know our national heroes, Maradona and Messi. So I, I decided to begin with a football metaphor. Uh, speaking about learning values, we know that learning the rules, drawing the field, is not exactly the same as playing the real match. And sometimes universities are all about blackboards, and theories and rules, and we have big speech, speeches about values. But uh, I, I'm sure Messi didn't learn to skip three Brazilians and make a goal, seated in a bench, drawing a goal in his copybook. But he learned to play by playing. Uh, I'm sure most of the gentlemen here learn football that way. I think values like social values, the, being a good citizen, is something we learn studying the laws and studying the values, but overall we, we learn by doing. We learn by practicing. We learn by emulating people who really uh, live these values. Uh, I think uh, many times in universities, we rely so much on theory that our students complain that when they arrive to real life, to the real profession, they don't know how to do it. And I, seem, I think that the same goes for social responsibility, for social engagement. Uh, sometimes we don't know how to teach our students to use the professions to uh, help develop our countries, to help uh, better our communities. So that's why I think this conference is so important because it's, it's in the central mission of the university to form good professionals. And we think good professionals cannot be formed if they only are thinking about their individual careers. We should be helping them to think their careers as part of a bigger picture thinking what they can do to help our societies be better. So uh, sometimes in most of universities, we have three different kind of activities going on at the same time. For example, we are collecting clothing and food for uh, the private rural community. That's very common in Latin America. There's an earthquake. We gather food and water for the victims. And that's service. But then you are in class and you have to design a solar panel in the computer 
and you have to present it for your final exam, that's clear it's learning. But when you design, and not only designing the computer, but produce the actual solar device and bring it to a deprived rural community and train the community to do the maintenance and, and to keep it, well, that's service learning. And in the picture you are looking at, a, a, a actual experience of that in Salta University in the northern part of Argentina, students used to draw the solar panels in the computer. And now with, with some funding, they are building the actual devices, bringing energy and new ways to, to produce to very isolated little populations in the mountains. So I think this is a good example of what service learning is, because they are providing this community with a very valuable service. Actually, they are changing the, their lives providing energy, but at the same time for the students, it's a way better way of learning all the curriculum because, you know, when our students have to give an exam, at least in our countries, if they can arrive to the sea, it's fine. But when you have to, to build the actual device, it has to work because it's for real people and you have to do it for an A. So you have to study more, to uh, learn to, sol to solve the problems in the site, and that's why they are better prepared also to enter uh, in a job place with more creativity, with more initiative, with more responsibility. So in a way, they are better professionals because they have better values. Uh, not always when we try to serve a com the community, we are learning exactly the same things. I think very realistic what a Cooper, an specialist in, in service from Florida International University says, that essentially three things can happen when young people go and get involved. They can learn a lot of things, for example, these city students from Salta City going to the mountains in the province, learn there were lots of different kinds of living in their own uh, territory that they didn't know. But you can also learn nothing. If the service program is not well planned, if it's not well planified, if you just go, well, you go visit and give something and distribute something and go back to your life, maybe you don't learn that much. And maybe something worse happened that through not well-planified activities, Cooper says you can learn the wrong lesson. And we as Latin Americans sometimes receive lots of well-intentioned European and North American students who want to help poor Latin Americans and come for a week and distribute the goods and go back to their home thinking, uh, oh, how lovely people is in Latin America, but they haven't understood anything about us and they haven't really make a, made a difference because they were like in a, a, a short trip to poverty. A friend of mine says he hates picnics to poverty because if you go for a picnic to poverty, you, you are learning the wrong lesson because you think that by giving very little time and very little thought, you can change and, and make a difference somewhere, and, and you really can't. So learning and service are not always a good match. So it takes uh, thoughts, uh, it takes planning to do a good service learning project. That's why I, I have found so, uh, useful, this tool that was devised by my friend Don Hill in Stanford University, and in Latin America we have it a little bit changed, uh, the quadrants of service learning. The, the vertical axis is like a thermometer of the quality of the service you are providing. If you are distributing a little bit of food in the community center, that's a little service, but if you are teaching people to grow their own food, well, that's a certainly a better service. So we measure the quality of service in the uh, vertical axis. In the horizontal axis, we are measuring how much 
intentional learning is embedded in the service. Sometimes when we try to serve the others, we learn a lot of things, but our professors didn't plan that we learn anything. Uh, we, uh, in other kind of projects, our faculty knows what they want us to learn through the service. So we have different points uh, alongside the, that axis. So in, with these two axes, we have in one stream the field work, the stages with no community service goals. Uh, oh, it's not working. Oh, no, it's working. The typical uh, activity where we go to the community to uh, learn about uh, the environmental, uh, the cultural, the issues we have to write a paper about. We go, we know, uh, we go back to the university, we get a grade, and that's it. Those are one kind of activities. Are very rigorous from the academic point of view, but you don't necessarily help anybody by doing your study. In the other extreme, we have what we call occasional community service activities. When, uh, for example, there's an earthquake, there you have Chilean students from Concepcion University. During the terrible earthquake and tsunami they had uh, two years ago, in, in an, a night, the whole campus collapsed and their university was torn to pieces, but the next day, students from the university were gathering bottles of water and gathering essentials to help their neighbors get on their feet. That's obviously a great service, but the, the main goal is to attend the emergency, not to learn something. Even if they learn a lot about organization, about the difficulties of facing uh, an extreme emergency like a, an earthquake. In the upper quadrants, we find what we call the institutional community engagement. And lots of our universities in Latin America have has their institutional programs with a vice president of engagement. They organize a lot of volunteering activities. For example, lots of students are working in what we call a roof for my country, the Latin American equivalent of Habitat for Humanity. And obviously, it's a very good service that university encourage volunteerism, but Maybe this student who is painting the walls for a new home for a family is a medical student or a psychology student. What the service he's providing has nothing to do with her, his or her uh, professional profile. Uh, so uh, in this kind of projects, usually you learn a lot about community, you learn a lot about uh, social issues, you learn social values. But it's hard to use this kind of activities in your professional resume when you are applying for a job because what you have been doing in the field of social work has nothing to do with your professional uh, profile. Instead, when we talk of service learning, we talk of a very specific kind of service. It's the kind of service when what you are doing to the, what you are giving to the community is your knowledge, is your skill, is your specific professional profile when, for example, as we were saying before, engineering students are building solar ovens or solar panels for a deprived community. That's a valuable professional practice and at the same time it's a valuable service. So. Uh, there are lots of service learning definitions. Uh, my friend, uh, one of my American friends counted some years ago, only in the US they have like 600. Uh, I think in Spanish we have a little less. But most of the definitions agree in three main characters, in three main programmatic features of service learning. The first is that you have an, a real a concrete service provided, but it's not done 
for the community, but with the community. As our uh, colleague said yesterday uh, and today, it's important to work with our community partners to be sure that we are providing what they really need and not what we think they ne may be needing from our labs. The second feature of service learning is there has to be active student engagement and leadership. If the project is not owned by the students, it will not be a, such a good learning experience because nobody learns from somebody else's experience. You have to learn from your own experience. So we have found uh, in, in Argentina, we have a presidential award for service learning, and sometimes we receive applications that are very well written, very well planned, but you immediately notice that it, it's the professor project and not the student's project. When there's the, really the student's project, there's lots of creativity, le, there's lots of, pa of passion, and some, s most of the times are better projects than when we are trying to go from up down. Five minutes left. Thank you. The, the third uh, characteristic of service learning is that where faculty is really involved and, and leading is that we know what, we are, what our, our students are going to do in the field, but we also know which parts of the curriculum will be involved, which skills will be developing. What, what values they will be learning, what skills they will be learning. Uh, I would like to show you three pictures of three of my favorite service learning projects in the world. Uh, they are done by very little kids, and I think it's good for universities to know that it doesn't take a degree to do great service. Uh, going from up to down, there are kids from a special school, kids with mental disabilities, they had this workshop building walls, and instead of building walls in their protected lab, they began to build actual houses for their homeless neighbors. And now they are not the special kids anymore. They are the kids that will build you a house if you are in the list. So they, they are really prepared to work when they go out of school because all the neighborhood knows the houses they have built. The little ones are kindergarten, uh, they are four years old, helping to plant originary species in a national park that was burned for the, in a big fire occasioned by a tourist and they are growing these native plants in their school garden to help the national park to be reforested. And then there's Ramiro, a sixth grader from a city called General Roca. They are blind students, and in their class, in Braille class, they wrote in Braille every name of every street of the city. They gave these tags to the technical school to be printed in iron, and then they offered that to the city council. So their city was the first city in Argentina to be uh, blind friendly and s signal in, in Braille. So we have learned that nobody is too little, too poor, or too special not to have something to offer to the others. We have different kind of experience from Buenos Aires University where all the careers are working uh, together uh, around the poorest neighborhoods in the city. And so, for example, um, fashion design, instead of working for fashion only, they design uh, textiles for women in a cooperative to, to have a good uh, product to sell, and veterinary schools are v vaccinating the local pets. Two minutes. Yeah. I in the last two minutes, I would say that our model of what we call solidarity or solidaridad, our model of service, it's not the traditional model where there is someone who knows, who has, who can, who gives, who have an active role, and somebody ignorant who is the beneficiary. Because we think this model, somebody learns to help, and somebody learns to receive and say thanks. 
we believe that the kind of solidarity we are trying to build from universities, it's a horizontal dialogue between communities, the, the university community and the local community, where we know something, but we know we have to learn from the community a lot of things. Uh, as the Vice Chancellor said, community is our classroom and we have plenty to learn from the community. So it's not about giving, but about sharing, about doing together, about building pro-social relationships, about uh, fraternity. So I will end with the same experience I began when the engineering students went to the rural community. They wanted to put solar panels in every house so that women didn't have to wash their clothes in the creek, which was frozen. But when women said, uh, listened to their plan, they said, you know, going to wash together in our culture is very important. And you are depriving us to the one moment in the day when we chat together, we exchange gossip. So they revised the project and built a community laundry center where they can wash their, their clothes with hot water, but do it together. I think that's the listening and the exchange that make our service really uh, significant for communities. Thank you so much for your listening, and I'm open to questions. Well, thank you very much for reiterating a really important message, namely that we learn by doing, not by just listening, a message, as many of you probably know, I've been hammering on relentlessly for 20 years. I'd never really thought about the fact that I think you pointed out so eloquently that that same rule also applies to social responsibilities. You learn these social responsibilities not by just listening to it, but by doing. And I think the need for matching the service to the learning is a crucially important one. Finally, I also like the point you made about ownership. The best way for students to learn is to take ownership of their learning and therefore making these projects, the students' projects, is crucial. So thank you very much for making that important message. Um, next up, next to last, is uh, Professor Paul, president of Maastricht University, who will tell us the, about the Maastricht approach to inculcating social values. Thank you very much, Eric. I also would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to present our approach, which is complementary to the others. And the Maastricht approach is basically focused on something that we call the international classroom. Well, I will go through a few definitions. We'll also then uh, show you why I believe that social values need to be not a project in a university, but it really needs to be at the core of the mission. I will give you some examples how we like to empower our international and national students to become global citizens, and I will also give some examples, which I believe is very important, how social engagement then in return can influence and form the agenda of a university in education and research programs. Well, what is it about the global citizen that we like to educate at our university? These are people who are aware of the world they live in. They respect not only values, but also diversity. They have an understanding how the world works in all complexity, economically, politically, socially, but also technologically and environmentally. They have a heart for social justice and are outraged for social in, by social injustice. And they contribute actively to the community in a wide range of level. They also want to make the, play, the world sustainable and take responsibility. That's a lot of things to do in a program. And the question is then, what can be done to follow and implement this concept? Well, I give you some basic facts and figures about our university. It's a young university. 
We have about 16,000 students, and as you heard from Eric's presentation yesterday, it's, it's very hard to beat Mass uh, uh, Harvard in numbers, but there's one number at least where we can beat them. We don't have 20%, we have 50% international students, and we are the most international university in the Netherlands and maybe also beyond the Dutch borders. Also 30%, and that's increasing, of our staff is non-Dutch, and our uh, programs are basically all offered, offered in English, and we are built on the concept of problem-based learning, which has evolved and developed over the years to really center on students teaching and learning from each other. I also should mention that we have 1% of these 116,000 students, 160 currently, are uh, from Saudi Arabia. Well, I told you the social responsibility is a core mission of a university and also of our university. And we believe the university has itself to be engaged in the local community, but also far beyond. And we have to address society problems. So we have, as a university, decided that we focus our research on three major societal challenges. One is a healthy society. One is to deal with internationalization and globalization. And the third one is innovation in the learning process. And Maastricht is helped because it's really at the heart of Europe, in the center of Europe, where it can really extend from its regional role to an international role. And to really bring this to the core value of our university, this is our mission statement, we will be a bastion for openness, freedom of thought, and freedom of speech, as well as a leader in the fight for justice. And our graduates are educated to be inquisitive, international, open-minded, they feel comfortable in an international environment, and they can easily work within and with various international and cultural and intercultural settings. Well, what are the factors how we educate these global citizens? One, we have international themes. We have men sometimes even mandatory periods of study abroad and internships abroad. We invest heavily in independent extracurricular social activities. I will come back to the international classroom. We have research projects that are dealing with societal challenges, and we are very engaged not only in the local community, but also in the international community. So what is this about the international classroom? We heard yesterday from Eric, I teach not by uh, telling something to the students by asking questions. And this is also what we do. The only thing is we have the students ask the questions to each other. And we just monitor this in the background. And in this process of asking questions to each other and develop common team-based solution, the cultural element, the cultural background of the student is very important. And uh, here you see uh, uh, this classroom. You see it's small scale teaching. We have 8 to 12 students in a classroom that really interact with each other. And they gain maximum benefit from their cultural diversity in this problem-based learning community. And this creates, over the whole university, an academic community with an international mindset and intercultural discussion. So many of our programs, as I said, are international. The students are trained, and we have an increasing number of joint programs with other universities worldwide. How are we doing this? I'll give you some examples. One is we already, in the bachelor phase, introduce research-based learning to really focus on interdisciplinary, social, relevant themes. And here are some examples how Europe affects its citizens and member states. We took a look at sustainability. And then the third one, also very important, as you know, Europe, Central Europe, was torn by wars in the last century, and it has now developed in a peaceful region. What can we learn from that, from other societies and students that come from areas where this is not the case? Then we also like to empower our students to take initiatives themselves, and we support these initiatives that are completely student-based financially and structurally. And I give you some examples. 
One is we have set up a so-called Green Office, which is a student-driven initiative to look at university sustainability portfolio. We have given it an independent role in control and give advice on sustainability projects to interact with the whole university community. They do this very actively over only a few years. And last year, our university won the award as the most sustainable university in the Netherlands. And this Green Office is then influencing educational programs, research programs, our operation as a university, and is also going out to the community, for example, by making a map in the city of Maastricht of the most sustainable shops and restaurants and facilities. So that also brings this idea not only within the university border, but also in our immediate community. A second example is Initiative Oikos, which is present at several universities. It's a student organization that strives to raise awareness about sustainability in order to ensure that a generation of future leaders will consider sustainability issues in their decision making. And this organization also reached out to communities in our environment and to companies in our environment to go into discussion with the current leaders. A third example is an initiative called Enactus. It's an entrepreneurial activity aiming at bringing academics and students together to look for common entrepreneurial projects that have social value. And some of the examples that these students are doing together with our government is improving the employment opportunities for disabled people in our city, decreasing food waste, educating children. They go out to elementary basic schools on financial literacy and how to handle money and supporting also immigrants in Maastricht. So they're very active in our immediate community. Also, we have an initiative on social entrepreneurship. We have a minor on entrepreneurship that's open to all bachelor students, so very early in the educational process. We have also a yearly entrepreneurship conference, and the theme is also then to look creating value in the society. We have also an initiative, you see here, the local heroes, where the students from our university that make the most effort to uh, the best project to improve the social conditions, the social engagement in our community, receives the so-called local hero award. And these are only some examples for student-based initiatives, but it goes beyond of that. We also need to implement this concept of international cultural diversity and social commitment in the university as a whole. This is one example. We have founded a few years ago a university college, which is a liberal arts and science project, which is our most international community, which really deals with social challenges in different cultures and social issues in different cultures, and is doing this by many guest lectures, debate evenings, for example, recently our Saudi Arabian students organized a debate evening on the role of women in Islam and debated about that with our students from Italy and Germany and the Netherlands. And this shows to really learn to understand diversity and what's behind it in a good way. There's also celebration of holidays, open mic events, study trips, and they also publish their own journal where they address these issues. This is just one example how you this social engagement then helps to shape a university program in itself. Then I give you some example on these university programs that are the result of this addressing of social issues. One is Mundo. It's an organization at our university that really supports international cooperation in underdeveloped countries in the developing world, and it supports many programs in countries such as in Africa and Asia. We have a Maastricht Center for Human Rights, a center that aims to be really doing research on human rights issues all over the world, and how globalization can challenge and even threaten human rights. This is something which is one of the elementary programs in our uh, law faculty and also one of the major research projects which we develop out of our vision on social justice. 
We also have in Maastricht a uh, place, a collaboration of our Social Research Institute in Innovation and Technology as a joint center with the United Nations University. This center explores the social, political, and economic factors that drive technological innovation, which is so important uh, to generate social justice, with a particular focus on the creation, diffusion, and access to knowledge. And another example that developed from the engagement of our medical student is a foundation entitled Mustang, and it's a non-governmental organization that's affiliated with our university, which was founded by students who wanted to do something in the engagement in uh, developing countries. So they have uh, built up a relation to a hospital in Ghana, and uh, the university and this foundation supports this hospital. And uh, the students are very active in our community to collect funds and money for this hospital. And they also spend every year, the whole year, several students spend here to work at this hospital, engage in themselves in this local medical work. My last point is that uh, the social engagement at our university doesn't stop with our faculties, with our students. It is also has to start much earlier, and that is very similar to the example we heard from Argentina. We have created a, an institution which we call Kids College. It's an annual lecture series for primary school children from our region. So they're very young, they're between 10 and 12 years. They're presenting what happens we present what happens behind the door of a university because academic learning, problem-based learning, is something else than being in a primary school. And the reason, the aim is to make children curious and interested in science, but also make them aware of societal issues. So you have some examples, what is of course interesting to children, like robot, robots and branding and marketing, but we also had recently an event in this college where we dealt with what happened to the outcomes of war in Central Europe and how did that affect community in a time of devastating conflicts in Europe. And that was also very interesting for these young children to go in a debate with our professors, our students, and make them aware of values at a very early time. Also that, I think, in my view, is the role of a university to reach out to other educational institutions at many levels to bring in these social values. It's also our social responsibility to offer something back to the community that supports us. So, in my conclusion, social responsibility is linked to global citizenship. These are key issues, the link between these two in our university. I think we focus this in a problem-based approach in an international classroom, in a classroom where students from many different cultures interact. They bring in their cultural experiences, they bring in their cultural issues, they also bring in their cultural motivated social initiatives and challenges. I think it is important to have a mix of top-down and bottom-up initiatives complementing each other. That means at the same time, empower our students to develop their own initiatives to implement social values and social issues in their program. And we as a university should support that financially and structurally. But secondly also, very important, that this bottom-up movement then leads to make changes in university structure, programs, and also perspectives. So it's a stimulation that's a two-way road, bottom up and top down, from students to professors and back. And secondly, I think that we have then also not only have this social engagement process as a movement in the university, but also leading it into specific research projects that then, of course, will carry this on further. And this is all I have to tell you, and I think I have three minutes, 25 seconds left. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Paul, for 
reminding us that social responsibility is not limited to the immediate vicinity of the university, but should really expand to the world at large through global citizenship. So we now turn to our final panelist, Arjes Tandon, who will talk about the knowledge democracy as a framework for social responsibility. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tandon. Assalamu alaikum, namaskar, and good morning. I am extremely thankful to the Honorable Minister and to Dr. Malik and his team for inviting me to participate in this international conference, focusing on a topic which is not generally seen as relevant in many parts of the world today. Social responsibility in higher education has resurfaced in many societies. And I want to congratulate the Ministry of Higher Education in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for taking this bold initiative and hosting this conversation. Most of us who prepare PowerPoints in advance, and there is a particular challenge today because the PowerPoint I sent in advance has also been translated apparently in uh, Arabic. Uh, we become victims of our PowerPoints. Um, and I generally believe that, uh, therefore, they are mostly pointless and they create powerlessness amongst speakers. So I'm stuck with my PowerPoint, though what I want to say is based on what I have been listening since yesterday morning. So I want to tell you, first of all, a couple of stories. I grew up in a joint family system in India. And um, I was fortunate to be encouraged by my grandparents and parents to get a good quality higher education. My first degree is in electronics engineering. My second degree is MBA. I became a teacher of management and then went to study PhD in the US. As I was going through higher education programs, I began to detest two behaviors of my grandmother which irritated me. First was that when I was growing up as a child, there was a small plant in the middle of the house, and she used to put a little water every morning and light, light a lamp every evening. And as I was going through university system, I said, she is superstitious. The second uh, act of my grandmother that used to irritate me was when I was growing up as a child, she used to chase me down to wash my hands before eating and to wash my hands after eating. And when I went to US to do my PhD, I started using paper napkins. My children started using paper napkins. Three years ago, last time I went to US, went to a McDonald's restaurant, and I found a sign saying, wash your hands. That practice of my grandmother, which irritated me as a child, has a scientific basis discovered 50 years later in US restaurants. That practice of my grandmother of watering a tulsi plant inside the house and placing a small lamp under it prevented us as children 
to destroy that plant. And 20 years ago, ecologists and botanists began to talk about community knowledge of preserving natural heritage, natural important plantations, herbs. And today, herbal medicine is being packaged and marketed by multinational drug companies. The practices of my grandmother, which I labeled as superstitious when I was going through university, now rediscovered to be scientific, has caused a great deal of tension and anxiety in me. And that tension is that the knowledge base of my grandmother's practice was very scientific 50 years ago also. Unfortunately, the education I was receiving was rejecting that knowledge, calling it superstitious, describing those practices as voodoo science, and delegitimizing the store of knowledge that my grandmother had acquired through oral tradition over generations. Why I am telling you this story is because in my view, the biggest challenge facing institutions of higher education today is to demonstrate their societal relevance in the societies in which they are rooted, in the societies from which they receive nourishment, and to do so in a manner that their students do become uprooted from their own traditions, but have the capacity to discriminate the lessons of their own heritage while they are imbibing lessons of nanotechnology. Learning nanotechnology and heavy-duty astrophysics does not need to be in contravention to or contradiction to the principles of knowledge and the practices derived from that which our cultures and traditions have inherited over generations and centuries. This is the core message that I am discovering in my work in India over the last 35 years. You will notice in this that I have talked about mainstreaming social responsibility in higher education. And the purpose of focusing on mainstreaming is so that it is not an appendix, it is not ghettoized in a corner, and it is not treated as an add-on for which you occasionally receive presidential awards and recognitions. But it is a part of everything institutions of higher education do, they do it with a sense of social responsibility. I am uh, fortunate that uh, last year, UNESCO invited me and my partner, Dr. Bud Hall, whom you will be hearing later in the day today, to be UNESCO co-chairs on community-based research and social responsibility in higher education. And it is an interesting invitation from UNESCO because I am not currently working in a university. I am working in a non-profit, non-governmental organization which partners with institutions of higher education to address relevant societal problems in our country and around. Now I would like to therefore turn my attention to what is this PowerPoint I had prepared two weeks ago. The first problematic in my country is the growing pressure on ensuring relevance of higher education. That we don't produce such graduates who begin to hate their own societies, their own traditions, and their own values. The title of today's session is Inculcating Social Values but a lot of those social values are already inculcated by the time students come to universities. We are facing a phenomenon of mass enrollment, growing enrollment, rapid growth, 
private providers, all these questions were raised by Gulam yesterday. Fundamental issue is knowledge for whom? Is knowledge a private gain or is knowledge a public good? Is knowledge a heritage of humanity or is knowledge for patenting? And this is the basis on which we then determine whether institutions of higher education are ivory towers, disconnected from society, producing knowledge in search of truth that other than themselves, nobody else can practice, or they are institutions of higher education building on the traditions of knowledge that are locally relevant and appropriate, but not delegitimizing or discarding those traditions. Therefore, for me, the question of engagement as a premise for social responsibility builds on not the issue of extension. Many universities in my country provide students with occasion, as Nevis was saying, to go and clean the villages or uh, provide water to the slums or food to the hungry. And this becomes an extension. The premise of extension is that those of us who are in institutions of higher education know, and those who are outside don't know. This is a false dichotomy, and this needs to be overcome. The principle of engagement has to be mutuality of interest and mutuality of knowledge. The second principle of engagement is in many of our universities in India, social work students, students of education, nursing, nutrition, only those students do community engagement. The physicists, the chemists, the metallurgists, IT professionals don't do community engagement. So we have ghettoized community engagement and the social responsibility in a few social science disciplines. But if you look at the science shop movement in Europe, the science shop movement in Europe was built on the foundation of providing the scientific disciplines of chemistry and metallurgy to engage with community in addressing some of the problems community is facing. So what principle of engagement suggests is that social responsibilities would be institution-wide and not limited to a few disciplines and few faculties. That the nature of the engagement should not be extramural or extracurricular or an evening pastime or something you do over the weekend but it should be credit linked, as other speakers have already added. Dr. Sharifa's presentation highlighted that very much. I want to bring in the question of assessment of teachers, researchers, and administrators in higher education institutions. That assessment should have one of the variables on promoting engagement and social responsibility in the nature of teaching and in the manner in which research is conducted. So unless we have these principles in place, engagement and social responsibility will remain an add-on, an appendix, an addendum, but not in the core mainstream of the work of higher education. The forms of engagement are, of course, multiple. Several speakers have already talked about it. I want to focus on the learning with community. The assumption is that there are multiple sites of knowledge. Community itself has a lot of knowledge based on its own practice, and that students build, researchers build their knowledge by interacting with community in ways which is mutually respectful and therefore creates a new synthesis of knowledge. The indigenous knowledge in the fields of health, water harvesting, ecological protection, all the aspects of sustainability came to our elders and my grandmother over generations through oral tradition. That need not be discredited or discarded. It can be refined and built upon. The recognition that there are multiple sites of knowledge also creates a sense of humility in our students and professors. Because part of the problem of social responsibility is that higher you study in higher education, higher is your arrogance and disconnect from society. Because you believe 
you know it all and everybody else who didn't go to higher education knows nothing. So this question of situating knowledge, knowledge production, and therefore the work of higher education in the societal context in which the institution is located becomes critical. Yesterday, Dr. Salim talked a great deal about the context. I don't want to dwell on it, except to say that lessons from the context are important in defining what is socially relevant and a priority set of issues that students and researchers must engage with. Our students sometimes in Indian universities learn history of the British Empire and Queen Elizabeth without understanding the history of their own neighborhood where they grew up. This disconnect makes them uprooted. I better make sure I run through my PowerPoint. Huh? The next point I want to bring is that in the field of teaching in higher education, we rarely utilize the knowledge of practitioners as teachers. In our view, as somebody mentioned yesterday, a government official or a retired diplomat can be invited as a fellow and be treated as a teacher, a co-teacher in a university. But a traditional indigenous leader whose knowledge of forestry or water harvesting is deep is never invited to be a faculty because he or she does not have the relevant qualification to be recruited as a faculty. But he or she, the best musicians we have in our country never went to university. But they are never professors of music. The ones who are professors of music are not even known as musicians or artists. Why this disconnect? Because we equate knowledge with degree and not with the way people have acquired that knowledge through the world of practice. It may be limited to the oral tradition to begin with. Now, what are some of the challenges in mainstreaming? The fundamental challenge, of course, is that we are living in a world where knowledge has become a commodity. To some extent, even the exhibition next door is demonstrating that. There are universities in the exhibition we know of whose work in social responsibility and community engagement is fantastic. But the exhibition is not talking about community engagement. What is being marketed there is how can you access this education, improve your career, make more money in your life, a complete disconnect with the society that you are a part of. The pressures for accountability arising out of the ranking issue that has been raised are also driving higher education institutions in a different direction. And as Dr. Sharifa has suggested and others have been arguing, it is important to bring engagement and responsibility as an integral set of indicators in any ranking system that we want to posit. And perhaps an alternative ranking system can also be created. The third mission should not be seen as distinct from the first and the second mission. It is always assumed that we will focus on the first mission of research and knowledge production, second mission of teaching and learning, and then if time permits, we'll do a little bit of third mission. But I think the message we are getting from yesterday, and I'm delighted to hear that message repeated from around the world, that the question of engagement in society and responsibility towards society has to base on a set of values, which are societal values, which are values relevant to be a global citizen in 21st century, the values which are not different anywhere, the values of justice, of inclusion, of well-being or happiness, those values must influence the knowledge production and the teaching function of higher education institutions. And therefore, the design of research projects and the design of curriculum and pedagogy must be influenced and inspired by those societal values. Therefore, in my view, the framework that makes sense is not the knowledge economy framework, because that commodifies knowledge, and it starts moving us towards patenting and private gain and private benefit and career, 
but a knowledge democracy concept which says that there are multiple sites of knowledge production in society. They need to be respected. There are different epistemologies and ways of knowledge production. They need to be valued and respected. And cognitive rationality is not the only way of production of knowledge. Action is as well, emotion as well. There are elements in our culture and spirituality which are ways of knowing and learning which is traditionally and historically validated. So if we take an open-minded and inclusive approach to how knowledge is produced, how knowledge is utilized, then we are talking about diversity of forms and not a monopolization or monocultural approach to knowledge, teaching, and knowledge production. In that sense, therefore, a knowledge democracy framework becomes the basis to integrate and mainstream social responsibility in our institutions of higher education. I want to make one last comment, and that is a request to Dr. Malik and many others of you who are here in Saudi Arabia and who have been interested in this topic in institutions of higher education, the Honorable Deputy Minister, that next month in Barcelona, Global University Network for Innovation, which is a UNESCO and UNU partner, is holding a global conference on this same theme. The theme is engagement, knowledge, and higher education, rethinking social responsibility. And I would like to invite you, invite many of you, to come and share your vision and your initiatives. Bring the Riyadh Declaration to Barcelona because you have valuable things to contribute. Despite the fact that social responsibility has now become a part of the Indian higher education policy, we haven't been able to hold a conference of the kind you have been. You are ahead of the curve, and I thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was struck by how your anecdote about the conflict between traditional knowledge and academic knowledge teaches us, us that societal values can be relevant to academic pursuits. And I also thought you made a very important point, namely that societal engagement should be part of the performance assessment that really provides a, a new angle. Okay, so we've heard a broad range of topics from how to maintain the principles of societal responsibilities in the transition to a research university, to the importance of matching service and learning, to global citizenship, and finally to principles and forms of social engagement. So we have about 25 minutes left for discussion. And to uh, make this discussion efficient, I would request that people in the audience first very briefly introduce themselves, name and affiliation, then keep your question, please, short. And maybe you would be so kind also to indicate whom on the panel you'd like to address your question. So may we have the first question from the audience? Let's see, where do we have a microphone? There, in the middle section. Heinz. My name is Heinz Fassmann, University of Vienna, Austria, and not Australia. Um, these are convincing and very sympathetic lectures. Thank you very much. Um, but Mr. Tandon said it, um, our university world is functioning in a complete different way. We are assessed by third party funding, by um, publications, uh, by patents, but not by social responsibility. Um, and to be a little bit more precise, Mr. Tandon, you said it, you want to make a new university ranking system. Um, <laughs> that is easy said in a lecture, but do you have any ideas um, who should do it um, and which indicators you want to use to measure social responsibility? So rankings typically do not take into account the factors we discussed this morning. I think uh, you briefly, I mean, one of you was talking about the conflict between rankings and social responsibility. Who would like to address that? 
I, I agree with you. Uh, definitely, every time, uh, whenever we go to meetings uh, that discuss rankings, uh, this is the issue that's uh, brought up. Uh, some ranking organizations try to incorporate by having context incorporated into the ranking measures, but I don't think they measure the impact of social responsibility. It's more of the countries or the nation's responsibility in terms of funding and so on. So we are trying to look at the various indicators, uh, at least in UKM. Uh, the easier ones are the economic, because you can measure income, number of businesses that you start, and so on. Um, um, environment uh, impact assessment uh, is also um, already have some indicators. But I think the challenging one is the community values. Uh, because what we found, you can bring economic advancement to a community. That doesn't mean they're happy or they value it. Um, for example, I give you the example of uh, Langkawi. Uh, ecotourism can bring in a lot of dollars into the island, but businesses are taken over by other people. Uh, it may not do much to the local people. So you need to actually do things that would be reflected in the, in the values that the co community cherish. And I think these are the, the kinds of indicators we're looking at. Uh, one area of research that UKM is very active uh, in is the unity concept, the indicators for unity, because unity is very important in, uh, in, in, in a country like Malaysia with so many ethnic groups beliefs and so on. And that's the foundation of our economic development anyway. So we have come up through our research uh, um, a tool for measuring this in every constituency uh, because usually political strife is the problem that's underlying the underlying problem of discord. And we have done this. We are testing the tool. So I think these are some of the ways uh, that you can come up uh, you can look at some of the newer measures to look at the impact of uh, the university. Uh, I think we need to collaborate in this area. It's not just about one university doing it, but I think getting uh, several people to do this together. In fact, in the Latin American Network of Service Learning, we are exchanging tools different universities has created to evaluate and to assess their social responsibility programs. And we find that uh, even if international rankings doesn't take into account social responsibility, there are national policies that can be implemented. For example, in Argentina, the evaluation of universities include the a number of research done with the community, the, the, re, the social relevance of the knowledge produced, and so now some very business-oriented universities are having to do something with the community because they weren't going well in the rankings. Very briefly. Just, just a very brief comment, I think. Uh, it's not a contradiction, performance and research, performance and ranking, and social responsibility. As I've showed in my presentation, our social context of human rights has led to establishment of a research center, which now receives top scores in European funding, and that will again, of course, positively influence the ranking. So it's not a contradiction, it's a continuum. Thank you for that uh, remark. Good morning, everybody. Actually, we wait annually what those international speakers will add to us from their experiences. Perhaps one of the hopes that we have is not just knowing what we need in our Saudi programs or universities, but rather the how to bring about those engagements and those experiences uh, in our system that is really very uh, unique in its national policies of work. For example, uh, the university societal responsibility spoken by the Argentina experience and the Malay experience um, gives not uh, the idea clearly spoken. Community service is not only given, but rather learning to our curriculum. And I've been listening to speakers since yesterday more, uh, afternoon and this morning. The only one example of given how about to bring this 
is to make it credited. Instead of having extracurricular or extramural, we have to make it accredited community service. But there is no other path shown of how about to build a curriculum uh, uh, around the needs of the community, learning from the engagement of the community. Dr. Aziza Rajab, Northern Border University in the Saudi Arabia. Rajas, you were talking about assessment of, uh, so maybe accreditation is not that far from assessment. Well, you know, the, there are many examples by which the curriculum has been transformed as a consequence of engagement. I can give you two examples from my own experience in a couple of universities. We, one example is where a university is located in a terrain where there's been a perennial water shortage. It's not a full desert, but it's approaching desertification. And the Department of Hydrology there has been, um, you know, producing graduates and postgraduates and PhDs based on a body of knowledge and a curriculum which uh, did not take into account the changing reality of desertification locally. One professor took a group of students to go and look at the traditional practices in the villages on water harvesting. It opened up a Pandora's box for them because traditional practices of water harvesting had water, but the modern systems of water uh, storage had run out of water. And so they began to think about a new way of adding material to hydrology curriculum to the courses that they were doing. And as a result, it triggered research because by doing research in partnership with those local communities, they learned how these systems were initially designed, why they have become not in use, what can be done to restore them. And so students are learning, curriculum has changed, and on the other hand, communities are benefiting. In fact, the professor of that program then made a presentation which changed the public policy of that province in water storage, water harvesting system. So it's a classic example of interacting in a way which locates your learning. By all means, let's learn about global systems as well, but uh, not at the cost of oversight to our local realities, because that's where you are rooted. So I think it, it can become a way of integrating curriculum change, pedagogy change, you know, learning like Eric was giving example, learning by doing, going out and, you know, the solar example, and also research change, because you start investigating reality in a different lens than you were used to. I said earlier that I don't mind sharing the method that we use when we talk about the credits. Uh, in our university, uh, we have what is called learning contracts. The students, um, uh, we have uh, learning outcomes that students have to achieve. These are learning outcomes like leadership, communication skills, teamwork, and so on. Uh, and they can use the community engagement to achieve these um, learning outcomes. And in the contract, they have to write what they are doing with the community and the objectives they are going to, uh, the outcomes they will uh, achieve through these projects and the impact on the community, what was the impact on the community. So they can do m many, like I said, the solar panel and so on. And then they have to propose this. There's a panel that looks at it and says, yes, I think they can achieve this. They can um, accumulate several projects, and this goes into the portfolio, and the final one they can present to a panel. And that's how they are graded. Uh, for their learning contracts. So, but it's a student-initiated uh, project working with the community, but also uh, addressing and acquiring the learning skills or the learning outcomes we want for them, apart from the community impact. We have another question here in the middle section. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very much, Yasser Barila from uh, Tajba University. I would like to uh, ask Professor Maria uh, about your initiative, Surface Learning. How do you embed these initiatives into the uh, courses or separate courses? And how do you evaluate the impact, whether it is positive on students or sometimes negative, or there is no uh, impact? Thank you very much. 
Uh, there are different curricular models different universities use sometimes at the same time. If you, for example, you have a, a regular curricular course where you embedded a service project according to your subject, you just evaluate what learning was done by the traditional ways, an exam, a practical exam, but you also have tools to evaluate the service part in the community. Usually it involves the same community evaluating the students, their participation, their creativity, their interaction with the community, and that's part of the grade that it's involved in the final grade. Uh, sometimes we, we have prof final professional practices at the end of the career performed in the community, and in those cases, for example, medical students going to a rural hospital, then the director of the rural hospital is part of the final board of examination, and he is part of the assessment board for that practice. I, I don't know if that was the, the question. Yes, I'd, like to, <clears throat> I'd like to have another question from the female section of the room. I, th I see a hand up right there. My name is Soha Jabaji. I'm uh, Associate Dean Research from McGill University, Canada. My question to the panel is, when you are talking about fundamental science, how do you integrate social responsibility and engagement of society? For applied sciences, I see there is opportunities, but for fundamental science, what are the criteria and how do we help scientists to do that in fundamental science? Number one, by integrating social uh, responsibility issues in the curriculum. We expect that our students that study, for example, uh, a fundamental scientific subject also do a, a minor in a, 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 a social relevant theme, for example, looking at uh, how uh, they can bring some of their scientific finding to the community, how they can integrate it in schools. For example, we have a project where um, uh, students in the biomedical field are teaching children uh, about some issues using, using their, their puppets or teddy bears to learn about disease and to learn about disease mechanisms. So this is just one example. You just have to make space in your curriculum for adding something on top of the hardcore natural sciences. Yes. Just to add a little uh, to this. I think uh, yesterday, Ghulam Mohammed Bhai talked about a very important way of integrating social responsibility in the professional development education professional education, be it uh, that of lawyers or doctors or teachers or you know, managers or economists or finance experts or whatever, engineers, whatever, we, what we equate as professions. And that is the question of ethics, professional ethics. In my society today, doctors <coughs> are the greatest impediment to healthcare. They are prescribing medicines and treatment, which is totally not needed. And I recently re read the same thing is happening in US, apparently. Lawyers allow the conflict to continue in the courts as opposed to resolving it. There are serious questions about professional ethics, which need to be rooted in the teaching of profession. Original definition of profession was not technical knowledge or expertise, but service to society. That is the value of a profession. And I think we need to integrate that in all our educational programs aiming at preparation of professionals. And, and let me add something to that as a, as a practicing professional scientist, even though I divide my time between fundamental science in physics and applied physics, I think that one way in which scientists can reach out to society is through outreach in the sense of awakening the curiosity for science. I mean, progress in society is determined to a large extent by advances in, in science and technology. We have a need for not only 
trained scientists, but also people who are in other professions who are knowledgeable about science. So any type of outreach uh, in science, I think, is, a, is, is of great value to society. We have a few more minutes. Before I forget, though, I want to make an announcement, namely that we'll break up in about 10 minutes and then go to lunch and reconvene at 1 p.m. So the sessions will resume at 1 p.m. in case I forget to say that. Okay, let's see, where's the microphone right now? We have somebody right there on the right side. Microphone number two, go ahead. Uh, 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 Mohammed Ziad Karamli, uh, Environmental Engineering, King Saud University. Uh, my question to the professor, the reactor of uh, the Holland and uh, from Holland. Uh, the first question is about the role of the Green Office. Uh, if you highlight more what the role of it in, in terms of environmental awareness. Uh, the second question to you, uh, we send our children to study bachelor or master or PhD to Western countries. Are they putting in their mind the differences between our culture and their culture? For example, in terms of human right, there's Islamic human right, there's Indian human right, there's different nations have different human rights than the human right in the West. Will, they, will the West put this in the mind of our students when they go abroad? The, third, the question to the reactor of the Indian uh, University, please. Uh, can you uh, redefine knowledge of democracy again? I couldn't uh, absorb it. Thank you very much. Well, if I may start, uh, as I tried to put on, our principle of education is based on the fact of cultural and societal diversity. That means you have to learn to respect each other's culture and differences. So we actually, as educated and teachers in our international classroom, we step back and we let really the students discuss. To give you one example, as I told you, we had a discussion that was actually implemented by our Saudi Arabian students to talk to students from other cultures about the role of women in Islam and to explain, because there are a lot of misconceptions, and also then get the questions from the other students and explain it. Another example which shows that uh, uh, students can learn from this as a, also an initiative from our st students, they went out to the city on the market to explain people about Islam. So it's really about learning from each other and an a, a, a international classroom and to educate global citizens just means to learn from diversity and respect of diversity because there are so many misconceptions about each other cultures in the world. That's what we want to achieve, that our students, when they are graduates, they have really this acceptance of diversity, which means you can be still also critical of each other, but you respect other opinions. I would like to get, I would like to get two more questions in. So one here in the front from Dr. Salim Al-Malik, and then we'll turn to the back for the final question. Thank you for all the speakers, and my questions to uh, Rajesh. You talked about community democracy, and every single country now is shifting towards knowledge-based society. What would be the difference between a knowledge democracy society and a knowledge-based society, taking into consideration the community? And my second question to Martin is, do international students um, be exactly or similar to local student when it comes to community services and community en engagement in a country that does not belong to them. Thank you. So let's keep our answers brief in order to make lunch. Well, we're getting early lunch today. Um, thank you. Um, I think, the, in my view, the way one can differentiate knowledge economy with knowledge democracy, as I understand, is knowledge economy tends to focus on commodification of knowledge and therefore commodification of higher education and expertise. It, its primary purpose becomes individual gain and benefit 
careerism, uh, you know, going up in the economic ladder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Knowledge democracy starts by acknowledging that sites of knowledge production are multiple in any society. They are in academe, in institutions of higher education, but they are also in community. They are also in practices that have evolved over generations, but may not be codified in our textbooks as yet. It also acknowledges that ways of producing knowledge is not just through instrumental rationality by manipulating cognitive symbols, but through also acting on a situation and through feelings. Phenomenology, action research, all these have been well-established approaches to knowledge production in the discourse on epistemology. Therefore, the purpose of knowledge is to address societal challenges facing people at any given point in time, and knowledge becomes heritage of the society as a whole, and not just individual producers of knowledge or those who patent it. This question is now in public domain, even in Europe. In India, the question is like this. Public funding of research and higher education institutions demands public accountability. Public accountability therefore demands that relevance of education and research to society. And in Europe, the question is, science for whom? Europeans are debating nanotechnology on the streets, not in our countries as yet. Very Mr. short, Paul. very short to your question. I mean, we as a university are role to provide the space, the finance, and the structure for social engagement of our students. And they choose what they want to do and how they do it. Sometimes the Arab students want to do it together as a group before they feel very strong about their beliefs. Sometimes they do it together with the Dutch and German and uh, British students if there are some topics they want to address. But the key is to leave it to the students and provide the space for them. So Ali Sayakun Arabi. هناك مفهوم لدى العديد من الجامعات الناشئة بأن الجامعة هي منتج هناك مفهوم لدى بعض الجامعات الناشئة بأن الجامعة هي منتج فقط لأفراد يخدمون سوق العمل في المجتمع مع تهميش جانب الخدمة المجتمعية كيف نستطيع تغيير هذا المفهوم إلى أن الجامعة هي المؤسسة الوطنية الأولى في بناء المجتمع وليس فقط في بناء الجامع الاقتصادي فيه ضحى الحيان جامعة القصيم I think also we want, of course, uh, our graduates to find a job and, and we do actively compute, contribute to, to economic well-being of a society. But I think we have to make space in the curriculum for additional social responsibility. Only if those two together, then it's really a benefit. That's why it's knowledge, skills, and competencies in this broad range are important to get the optimal package. It's not either or, it's both are important. Well, I'm delighted to see the uh, engagement that this uh, session brought. Unfortunately, time is forcing us to finish up and wrap up. So I'd like to thank the audience for its active participation. And I also want to point out that we have a truly global panel here spanning Southeast Asia, North and South America, and uh, Europe. And I, I thank the panelists for their points of view on how to bring about social engagement. Thank you very much.